Hello YouTube, this is Adam Noyce of AN Productions and welcome to this episode of the Godzilla Vlogs where we talk about anything and everything Godzilla. This isn't going to be a review for Mothra vs. Godzilla, I swear. This isn't like me, I have no notes. Uh, in fact, that's how I do all my Godzilla Vlogs is I never take notes. Again, they're Vlogs, it's me just kind of speaking out of my ass. When I do reviews, I usually, nine times out of ten, with a couple exceptions like Cannibal Holocaust, I take very detailed notes. But recently I just got done watching Mothra vs. Godzilla for the first time in a few years. It was, it's been a few years. And I will say that Mothra vs. Godzilla was the third Godzilla film I ever watched. And I watched it with my father when it played on Turner Classic Movies, the American cut of the movie, for the world to see. And that's how I watched it. I was, I was really captivated by it. Because it, one, it was, it was extremely colorful. I mean, that's one reason why I think the Showa era um, made, uh, they didn't make, the Heisei, for me, the Heisei series will always be the best Godzilla movies, or my favorite of the Godzilla movies, because it's, it's a continuing continuity. But Showa era made, in my opinion, the best movies, because they were always very imaginative, and always full of these grand colors, and they just looked so dynamic, and, and this movie really is no exception. This movie is very colorful, and, and utterly entertaining, and that's what I want in a Godzilla movie, is something that's very entertaining. But I found myself, you know, watching the film this time, and, you know, still grinning like a little child, because nostalgia was hitting me, but yet at the same time I still think it's a very good movie. Hell, it's my second favorite, no, it's my, yeah, it's my third favorite Showa Godzilla movie, alright? But I found myself asking, like, what's so special about this movie? What makes it stand out above other Godzilla films, because, let's face it, this movie has a lot of the stereotypical Godzilla tropes. It has, you know, the news reporter, it has the scientist, it has the military trying to stop Godzilla no matter what, it's, you know, got Godzilla's theme, and, you know, this, it has a lot of the tropes in which, you know, especially Showa Godzilla, and in quite a ways Heisei Godzilla as well, has, and each one of those movies has. You know, no, one of those tropes actually being that none of the characters are really three-dimensional, but they're memorable. And the more I started watching it, the more it suddenly hit me as to why this movie stands out and, and why this movie does everything. One is this movie has an unbelievably tight screenplay written by Shinichi Sakazawa. An unbelievably tight screenplay. But the other reason, which we'll probably get to later on in this video, is that this movie created all of the actual, we'll tackle it right now, this movie created all those Godzilla tropes, all right? We had Godzilla Raids Again, which wasn't very successful and critically panned, and it was, quite frankly, not very good. It's not a very good movie. Then we had King Kong vs. Godzilla, which I think is a piece of crap. That was the second Godzilla movie I ever watched, and I thought it was crap then. I was unbelievably bored by it, and I still think it's crap now. Even the Japanese version, I think, is crap. Again, these are my opinions. Uh, <laughs> these are my opinions. Please don't kill me for them. Uh, but this movie really is what set up, you know, the kind of stere stereotypes, specifically of the rest of the Showa series throughout the '60s. And that was, you know, you have you have news reporter, uh, you have a scientist. You know, this movie doesn't have a policeman in it, but you know that kind of goes along throughout the rest of the Showa series. But another thing that this movie really sets up. Uh, that becomes a trope throughout the later series is that this movie has unbelievably mem has, has a really good cast very very good and strong cast and what I mean by that is that they're not necessarily three-dimensional I've always said that you don't necessarily have to have three-dimensional characters in a movie as long as you make them memorable and this movie definitely has memorable characters I will always remember Akira Takarada and Yuriko Oshi and definitely Hiroshi Koizumi just because he has kind of like that everyman kind of look. But especially Koyama, um, uh, Kumayama, who play, who, he's, he's the villain of the, or one of the villains. Him and Kenji Zahara are like the villains and they're, they're so over the top but yet they're so subtle and, and everything like that. It's great. But like that alone makes it very memorable. These are very, very memorable. Even the side characters such as Jun Tazaki's character who plays the editor, he's very memorable because he's got all these lines and he's bickering back and forth and he's constantly yelling at that reporter for eating an egg. Little shit like that. Even the general who has like three fucking scenes in the movie, I, I remember because first off, I love that actor. He plays such a good militarist. But two, 
the look on his face, he's so serious and he's so into his role that it really sells it. And that really goes into the screenplay. The screenplay in this is written by Shinichi Sekizawa, which there were two writers, if you watch Shiro honda I get into this a lot, there were basically two writers writing Toho science fiction movies that around this time period. You had Takashi Kimura, who was very pessimistic, very dark, uh, made his, a lot of his movies had way more allegorical essences in it. He wrote Rodan, for example, you know, the, one of the darkest movies to ever feature a kaiju in it. And then there was Shinichi Sekizawa, who made a lot more lighthearted movies uh, that didn't necessarily focus as much on the science uh, and just kind of focused on, you know, what was fun. I mean, that was Shinichi Sekizawa's kind of philosophy was it didn't really matter about if it was factual or not as much as it makes sense in terms of the story and if it's fun. And, you know, it's, it, it helps pace out the story, and it, that's in droves here. For example, there's a scene where, like, Yoriko Oshi and Akira Takarada have their radiation taken away from them by just getting steamed. It was purple, but whatever. Typical Toho science fiction logic of the time, and that's one reason why I fucking love the Showa era, is because you can get away with shit like that. But this has an unbelievably tight script, and what I mean by that is the banter, I wish I could snap my fingers, because it's really, it's really, really quick. The banter that goes on between these characters is unbelievably good. And right from, even right from the get-go, you have, uh, you know, Yurko Oshii's not taking any pictures while Akira Takarada is a lead reporter and he's like, come on, just take freaking pictures, this isn't art, this is a newspaper thing. You know, they're snapping back and forth. There's a relationship there without them actually stating that they have, like, some kind of relationship. There is one there already, just in their dialogue, and that's good stuff. Uh, and... The other thing that this movie really succeeds at, like, showing off way better than in King Kong vs. Godzilla, this movie really shows the weight of Godzilla. Um, this movie really shows the fact that, you know, he shows up and people freak out in King Kong vs. Godzilla, but they have, what, one conversation about them possibly using a nuclear bomb? I'm not even sure if that's in the Japanese version or not, because I can't remember, but I know it's in the American cut. And there's only one scene, really, where they have tanks going up against Godzilla, and they only have one line of defense against Godzilla. There's not very much that the Japanese do in terms of Godzilla. This movie, when Godzilla returns, and this movie beautifully plays it off, is when Godzilla comes back to Japan, Everyone is freaking the fuck out. The American version actually plays it up more with the frontier missile scenes where they actually go to America for help. Uh, but the military's like, okay, Godzilla's back and we need to kill him. We need to kill him now before he kills us. And I love that. And that's really portrayed in the military scenes. It's beautifully executed because not only do, you know, these, these uh, soldiers, do the JSDF have actual plans to combat Godzilla as explained in the screenplay, but they have backup plans in case that plan fails. So you don't just have like one grand hurrah and then that fails and oh god, now we're fucked. No, they have backup plans. They, at first they just want to electrocute Godzilla and that doesn't work. It wasn't quite strong enough. So then the, the backup plan was to drop nets on them and do that. You know, it's great stuff like that. And that's what really sells this movie above a lot of the other ones. Or, or as I should say, uh, above a lot of, uh, of the other Godzilla movies, especially previous. <laughs> this movie is leaps and bounds better than King Kong vs. Godzilla. I think, I think Mothra vs. Godzilla is a goddamn masterpiece and should be seen as a really large, if anything, a massive cult classic. The other thing that like really set this movie, what makes this movie special really, is that this was made in the heyday of Toho science fiction movies. This was literally the peak of Toho science fiction movies. Three kaiju movies were made this year. Two in which are utter icons, and this is one of them. You have Mothra vs. Godzilla, which became one of the greatest Godzilla movies ever made. Period. You, you hard find a fan. It's hard to find a fan that says that this isn't a good movie. Then you have Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, which in some ways is an even more iconic movie because of King Ghidorah. And then you had a lesser-known movie called Dogoro the Space Monster, which I think that movie is a steaming pile of horse shit. But you can watch my review on that on a Shiro Honda thon. Three movies, all of which were directed by Ashiro Honda. Now, this was before Ashiro Honda started getting bored. It, it, it started, he started hating his career in, when he made Dogra the Space Monster. It was like a, a switch was like turned in his head, and that's when he realized that, oh, I, I've fallen into a trope. And that was to make science fiction movies. Now, here Ashiro Honda was very much so excited, still excited, and still very happy with his career to try to make as many, many movies as possible to make a science fiction film. And uh, he had a huge say in, you know, the, the screenplay and 
And Shiro Honda is the reason why I believe that sequence where uh, our three protagonists go to Infant Island and, you know, they talk about humanity and everything like that and wonderful things. Uh, you know, the whole essence of, you know, it may be our problem, but one day it may become your problem. We are all human. That's a very Honda thing. And I think he's the reason why Shinichi Sekizawa added that into the screenplay. Speaking of tropes, speaking of that sequence, I love how it's the female, it's, it's the woman, who brings that up. If there's anything I love about the Godzilla movies, is that God's, the Godzilla movies tended to have really, really strong and pivotal female characters. And they weren't like characters that would often like, hold on to the man while the man does everything. I mean, sure, the original Godzilla was kind of like that, but even she was still, even Emiko was still really pivotal. In this movie, it's the girl, it's Yuriko Oshii that's like, I'm begging you, you have to help us in this situation. It's the woman that carries everything out. If you, if you watch from, like, especially this point onwards, it's really, women have a very significant role to play in the movie, even if they're villains. I mean, Look at, um, in, in Terra Mechagodzilla, you have Katsura, one of the greatest characters to ever set for, to ever be put on screen in the Godzilla movie, and, and she's a wonderful character. Um, you basically have two kind of female protagonists that this movie really created. Uh, you had the Shiro Honda ones, which they were usually very intellectual. They weren't necessarily like brawn, but they were unbelievably intellectual, and they were usually the people, or the person, to kind of convey the humanistic element of the, of the story. And then you have the Jun Fukuda female protagonist, who is the opposite of that. Um, they are unbelievably strong. They don't necessarily carry the, mor carry the morals of the movie. However, they are unbelievably strong-willed, and they have these really strong personalities and very physical like characters. For example, in uh, Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, you have Kumi Mizuno's character, who's a native, and she escaped, and she's a fighter. Uh, in uh, Son of Godzilla, you have uh, um, you have that native girl. She's Japanese, but you have Matsumiya. Her last name is Matsumiya. I can't remember. Oh god, I'm blanking on here. But again, she's kind of the same thing as Kumi Mizuno. And then you have in, you know, Godzilla vs. Gigan, you have that one that knows jujitsu. You, 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 see, you see the constant kind of thing here. While Shiro Honda has female characters that kind of are way more intellectual or kind of play a more pivotal role that are more subdued. Uh, for example, uh, probably my favorite example of this actually was in Invasion of Astro Monsters, a.k.a. Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, where you have Kumi Mizuno's character, who doesn't do anything physical. But she plays, she, she carries the human side of this story, where she, she is torn with her love for Nick Adams' character and her sense of duty to the Planet X aliens. Uh, and also, again, I'm, I'm going to say this, in Terror Mecha Godzilla, you have one of the greatest human characters ever, uh, Tomoko Ai playing uh, Katsura, who her whole essence is literally the human element of this story. What defines, like, what defines me being human? When do machines go too far? When are you no longer a human being? When do you lose your soul? That, she literally is what carries the heart of the story. So, this movie, Mothra vs. Godzilla, really set up, especially that trope, in which the human, the female character winds up becoming the kind of moral center or like the strong point of the movie. And that would later be carried on by Tez uh, director, I forget his first name, but Tezuka, when he directed um, both Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, which is kind of a crappy movie, but you still have a very strong-willed human character, and especially in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, where you actually have a very good female character in that film. But another thing that really makes Godzilla, I mean Mothra vs. Godzilla 1964, Mothra vs. Godzilla special, is I remember as a child it really setting the standard for the Godzilla design. This Godzilla design is a lot, one, it's, it's one of my favorite suits. But if you look at this one, it manages to be slender, but yet freaking terrifying. It has a face that just utterly captures the fear of Godzilla. You know, the, you look at that and you just see it's utterly menacing. And there's some great close-ups. The one that I immediately think of, uh, uh, there's some great close-ups. The one that I immediately think of is the one where he's about to smash the egg, and it just kind of it gets an extreme like push in on his face. It looks very menacing, very very well done. But it sh but Agent Tsubara was really on his A game. 
this movie. I mean, this is this is the peak of his career as well. He was so on his A game in this movie, and specifically, as wonderful as the Godzilla suit is, the Mothra puppet is so dynamic and is so much better than the one from the original Mothra in 1961. That puppet was very stiff. This move, one, there's several shots where it's like its legs are constantly moving, its head's bobbing around, its wings are very dynamic, and they're not very stiff. This Mothra puppet is fucking phenomenal, and it looks amazing. And there is a lot of shots, and beautifully portrayed in Toho Scope too, where you see Mothra's wingspan just taking up like 90% of the screen. It's huge, and I couldn't imagine just how uh, dynamic the puppetry and how, how, how dynamic the wire work must have been on it. Though, I guarantee you that was nothing compared to King Ghidorah, made just a couple months after this. In my review for Atragon, I said there were a bunch of blue screen shots that don't look very good at all. That was because this was, that was before A.J. Tsuburaya managed to pull some strings of Toho and get his hand on a good optical printer. Mothra vs. Godzilla was the first time that A.J. Tsuburaya was able to use the optical printer. And it's really brought forward in integrating a lot of the scenes with the Shobajin, the two fairies, and the human characters, which are very beautifully matted together, mainly because of this optical printer. Now, uh, Agent Subaru and his crew could do what other time, what, what beforehand they could not do. They were able to blend a lot more. And that's why, really, in this movie, if you look at it, has a lot more double projection shots than any other, really, Godzilla movie made I, uh, for the show era. I mean it. Um, for example, the attack on Nagoya is just chock full of them, and one of the ones that always stands out above me, for me, is when the, uh, the, you have that teacher, the principal or whatever, who's saying there's still children on Iwa Island, and all of a sudden Godzilla pop, his head pops up over the mountain. That image has always stayed with me to this day. It, it, it always has, and that wouldn't have been done very well if it wasn't for the optical printer, uh, the use of that optical printer. And there's only two in the world, and Agent Tsuburaya got his hands on them, just to show you how much clout he had at Toho. But special effects are phenomenal. And, and, and uh, Akira Fukube, this movie would not have worked anywhere near as well as it did without Akira Fukube's music. Akira Fukube basically took the themes that were from King Kong vs. Godzilla, which the soundtrack for King Kong vs. Godzilla, the Japanese version, is okay, but it sounds very experimental. He took all of the themes from that movie especially the ones for Godzilla, and just put it into this movie and he perfected it. This was the movie that really solidified Godzilla's theme. You hear this theme and you're like, Godzilla. It solidified it. It utterly solidified it. And on top of that, he was also working with other score. He, the Mothra song, for example. He basically took the Mothra soundtrack and perfected it here. Uh, again, it was just almost like a take two for him. Because normally, Akira Fukube would be working on five, six movies a year, so he'd oftentimes would just have to write one version of the score, one draft of the score, and call it good enough, because he didn't have time to actually go through and do another draft. This movie, a lot of his scores were from other films, were already put into other films. So he took them and perfected it. It's kind of what happened in Varan the Unbelievable, where he did the soundtrack for the TV version of Varan, and then all of a sudden that fell through, and then they made the movie version, and Shiro Honda said, go back and redo the score, and then he perfected the score there on take two. Same thing kind of happened here. So Godzilla's score is utterly and totally solidified here. And above that, we in this movie have a lot of the establishment of Mothra's songs, the Shobajin songs, which I think no one can ever top the Peanuts for being able to play the Shobajin. No one will ever top them. And you have these great, these great songs, like for example, Sacred, I think it's Sacred Springs or something like that. That song screams Mothra. And unlike the original Mothra in 1961, this movie was not upbeat with their songs. This movie was very melancholy with their songs because, well, that's the whole thing with Mothra in this movie. One, she's dying, and then two, the egg is out of their control. So it's very melancholy. And even the Mothra song, which is very, very upbeat, you know, the, the actual Mothra song, it's very upbeat in Mothra 1961. Here there's a melancholy sense about it, which was Akira Fukube's specialty beautifully, 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 beautifully portrayed here that established a Mothra songs for the rest of the freaking Godzilla series. Even in Tokyo SOS, they used Akira Fukube's music, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, 
Yeah, so that establishes that. But another thing that really needs to say, I know I'm all over the place, but another thing, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about before I'm going to let you go. This movie really, again, going back to the screenplay, really had something to do for our main protagonists. For example, after Mothra comes, right, and starts fighting Godzilla and then she dies, what's there really left for our human characters? I'll give Shinichi Sekizawa and Ashiro Honda, really, because Ashiro Honda needs more credit on the screenplay on this than I think he actually gets. What other human characters left? They've done their job. They got Mothra to fight, but oh my god, Godzilla's still here. There's still about like 15 minutes left in the movie. So they created, so Shinichi Sekizawa was like, well, we gotta have the humans do something. So he even like made up the whole children's side plot where the children are trapped on Iwa Island. So I will give him the, this movie props for that, for still trying to integrate the, char integrate the characters into the story itself. I think it's actually done a little better in Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, uh, the Three-Headed Monster, even though I think Mothra vs. Godzilla is the superior movie, but that, yeah, I think it's done unbelievably well. So that's really what's special about Mothra vs. Godzilla. Uh, you know, it created a lot of the tropes for future Godzilla movies. It basically created the Godzilla franchise, this, this film. It really created the franchise and made it a genuine franchise, because this movie was an unmitigated success. This movie was a huge success. And it basically solidified that Toho had a moneymaker. <laughs> I mean, King Kong vs. Godzilla was a huge hit, even bigger than this movie, but they still didn't really know what they were doing, so then they made this movie, and it really just solidified that we have a pop culture icon here. So hit the like button, leave a comment as to why you think Monster vs. Godzilla is special, or why do you think it's a piece of shit, because, I don't know, you probably do. Um, you know... Uh, go on Facebook, like AM Productions for up-to-date information about what we're doing here. Um, like which way they walk on Facebook. You can actually go on to YouTube now and you can actually watch the movie. Please do. Please help support independent movies. And go on Facebook and like the Godzilla saga. I'm now really head deep into writing it. I'm kind of going on a writing binge right now with, that, with, that, with those books. And she's going strong right now. So, in the end, this is Adam Noise of Van Productions saying, sign off. <laughs>